Welcome to episode 12 of the Hunt Backcountry podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. In tonight's episode, we have none other than Corey Jacobson. Corey's a multiple, like eight time multiple world champion elk caller. He's a magazine publisher, magazine editor. He's pretty much done it all. Films, you name it, he's done it. But most importantly, he's a down-to-earth, humble dude that just absolutely loves to elk hunt. So in tonight's episode, we talk with Corey about um, some tips and tactics, of course, including some right now tips and tactics for post-September elk hunting. We talked about getting his son involved in elk hunting and the success that they've had. We talk about some changes that are being discussed and potentially proposed for um, how Idaho elk hunting is structured and should Idaho take on the point type system, the bonus point system that so many other western states do. We talk about the history and the future of Extreme Elk Magazine and Elk101.com and we get into some maybe controversial topics such as the frontal shot. So we cover a lot. It's an absolutely fascinating conversation with Corey. Here's the episode. So, Corey, I thought it'd be kind of fun to start off just uh, hearing how your fall's been. I mean, here we are near nearing the end of October. I know you've obviously been after elk in a couple few states. And so what's what's the fall brought for you? You know, it's we dream of elk hunting for 11 months and, and then we get there. And it seems like every year, you know, the expectations don't always align with, with what our dream held. But right. or the, the results don't align with our expectations, maybe is a better way of putting it. But this was a, another year just like that. You know, I hunted in Wyoming and Montana, both just on the general archery tags and uh, had two completely different hunts just a week apart from each other. But Wyoming was was really good, had a great time there, and then Montana was much more challenging. Yeah. So what were the factors that made those two so different? <laughs> uh, it can be summed up in two words, elk hunting. <laughs> <laughs> it changes every day, every draw, every elk. It seems like it's it's continually changing you out on public land with the general tag. It's yeah. There's no guarantees, but you know there was uh, a few things I think in in play. Wyoming, there's not nearly the predator population in the area we were hunting. We hunted early. The weather was really consistent and nice. Uh, the bulls weren't herded up yet, so they're a lot more responsive to calls. And then Montana, we hunted a little later in the season. Had some inconsistent weather. A lot of predators. I mean, we had grizzly tracks in our tracks every day. Wow. Um, just, you know, some, some variables there. A much lower elk density in the area we were hunting in Montana. Uh, you know, to, to contrast that, though, in Wyoming, we hunted an area there were a lot more people, but we were able to get away from them. Whereas in Montana, the area we were hunting, there were fewer people, but the few people we ran into, it seemed like we were hunting the same areas. So Yeah, kind of on par with the effort and the dedication and the areas and that. Totally, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, so that's one thing that's interesting. One of the questions I kind of wanted to ask you, and I know the answer, but I think it'd be interesting to hear you elaborate on. You know, you have obviously been hunting elk for a very long time, uh, you know, you've done everything from professional calling to publishing a mag. I mean, you're just, you know, and as involved as elk as you can be. But with that, I still was wondering, do you learn still every year? And if so, like, (laughs) you know, what are the things maybe from this year or recent things that you're sort of learning and adapting, even though you've been around so long? Totally. You make me sound really old by saying that, Mark. But, you know, I, I have. I was fortunate. I grew up in a hunting family. Uh, I lived in elk country all of growing up. You know, my, my formative years were spent in elk country. Uh, I could walk out my back door with my bow in my hand at age 12 and, and literally have a chance of seeing elk. So I have been hunting a long time. But with that said, I still consider myself a, a student of a very challenging game and in no way do I ever step into the woods and think I've got this one um, completely figured out. It's it's definitely 
something I look forward to learning. I look forward to that adventure. Um, and I think if we ever think that we have it figured out and think we know the elk better than the elk know themselves, uh, we're, we're setting ourselves up for a big dose of humble pie. Yeah. So as far as what, what did I learn, man, it's, you know, it, it really comes down to the basics and there's, there is luck involved. You know, I'm, I'll be the first one to, to admit that when things work out, there is definitely a, a level of luck. Just the wind doesn't switch because that's, that's for me, probably the biggest thing to overcome is just the thermals and the wind. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm an aggressive hunter. So I get up there, a bull's bugling across the draw. It's nine o'clock in the morning. The thermals are right there at that transition point. I want to push. I want to get over there and say, you know what, let's try to make it happen in the next 15 minutes. And if we mess up, so be it. We move on to the next one. And, you know, I think to a degree, I'm starting to, to transition more into a patient hunter. Um, you can ask the guys I hunted with this year and they'd probably argue with that. But <laughs> I think I push the envelope and mess up more than, than what most people would like. But, um, you know, I, I think I am transitioning and at least thinking, hey, if we do wait this out another two hours, uh, we'll have a better chance than trying to force it here in the next 15 minutes. So um, maybe that's a, a lesson that I'm slowly learning and, and this year added to that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, a couple other ones, you know, timing is everything on those elk. When we're trying to call especially, you know, that's my style of hunting, of aggressive and calling and aggressive calling to be even more specific. Uh, there's there's a time frame, there's a window there when it works best. And so trying to time that and get everything to align just right for my style of hunting and trying to spread that into maybe two different hunts throughout the season can be a challenge. So trying to figure out, okay, this state's good early, this one hits a little bit later and, and make it so I don't waste time. Last year I felt like maybe I, I did things wrong. We went to Montana the first part of the season and then went to Oregon the last part of the season and we had tough hunts in both places, and I think it was just the timing. Had we flipped around, it probably would have been great hunts in both states. But uh, so that you know, there's just there's things that we're continually just tweaking and massaging to get right. And it seems like once we think we have it figured out, it changes. So we back to the drawing board. Yeah, that would, it'd be boring if you did have it all figured out, right? Like if That's, it was an easy game and you never knew, or you always knew what you're getting into, there you'd lose some appeal. But I think that's one thing is it's always interesting. You never know what your experience is going to be, especially, you know, like you're doing when you're headed into different states and different times and things like that. Totally. And yeah, I mean, the challenge is I, I had a guy email me this week and he was giving me a, a recap on his season. And he said, with a bow, the tiniest things kept me from harvesting a bull this fall. Yeah. And he's yet to kill an elk with his bow. And that's, I mean, he summed it up right there. It's right. its a challenge. There's yeah. every little thing has to happen in order to, to get it done right. I mean, the smallest thing, you can call a bull and you can have a great setup, and then you raise your bow arm too much to draw and the bull spots you moving and he's gone. That one little tiny mistake is the difference between zero and hero. And Yeah. And it is. That's, and I think that challenge is what brings it all back around for us. When we are successful, the reward's so much greater because... We know we worked for it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's pretty much exactly how, how my season went this year. Was We had good encounters, uh, a good number of encounters, especially considering the conditions. I mean, we kind of hit full moon, and it was hot, so they were mainly talking at night, and they'd pretty much shut up as soon as daylight hit. And so, you know, it made things tough, but it was one of those trips where it was like, man, things, considering the conditions, I feel like we did a good job of hunting, and everything like that got to full draw twice. It was just those little things of, you know, I got pinned down in a spot and couldn't move and he was in the open. And so, yeah, I mean, especially with archery, it's just so tough for everything to come together. I mean, it sounds like a cop out thing to say, but we truly would have been tagged out, you know, opening morning or the first morning of our hunt, I should say, if we were rifle hunting. But yeah, just everything coming together is, is can be difficult. Steve, we talked yeah. a little bit about your Idaho hunt and how that was going. Uh, mm -hmm. Has that fully wrapped up for you? Yeah, yeah. Season closed back in the middle of October, so no luck for me. I didn't get to hunt too many days, but not much different. I had one day I talked to Corey about it where I had two, two, three, twenty, three thirty bulls within thirty yards, and just brush and wind, and you know, it's uh, Corey. You're talking about patience. You know, that's 
I, you know, I think a, a key as a hunter is to identify your weaknesses, and that is by far mine. Um, and and just keep working on it every year, but having the patience to know, like, hey, eventually this is going to happen. Don't freak out and make mistakes and rush things. Uh, but I just ran out of time, so it was kind yeah. of a bummer. Um, and uh, looking forward to getting back to it next year. Yeah. So on that topic of patience, Corey, and you mentioned you are an aggressive hunter and have been an aggressive hunter. I'm curious to know when you do kind of that scenario you talked about before, you maybe you have that 15 minute window and you think the thermals might switch, but you have a, a small window to try and make the play now. And historically you've made that play in a scenario where you have busted that bull. Um, what's your play on him from there on out? Are you kind of leaving him alone for the day? Do you ever circle, make another play soon? Do you just kind of keep that in your back pocket to maybe come back to later in the trip? What's been your experience? Yeah, you know, and that's, it's a great question. And I think it really, it really depends. Every situation's different. Every area, they'll sometimes, you know, react a little bit different. A um, couple examples this year in Wyoming, the bulls were in their, what I call their staging area. They hadn't gone and rounded up the cows. And so it seemed like every high knob with a north facing slope had a bull parked on it. And he was there alone or with one or two cows, you know, the rut hadn't kicked in. They weren't aggressive with, with staying with the cows. And so we would get in there and and call in a bull. He would turn and leave and go right back to his knob and he would stay there. Now, if we tried to go right in after him, he's a little spooked. He's a little cautious. You know, the odds of getting him back in are lower, but to come back in the next day, even, you know, it seemed like he'd forgot about what had happened and was fired up and came running back in. So, you know, that's that's one case that's a lot of fun. Um, I think once you start getting in there and they get herded up and have a lot of cows, if you continually are bumping those cows or the cows are winding you, I think that, you know, in that situation, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to get in there, you know, the next day and and have the same results you did the first time. Um, but on the flip side of that, my son and I went out, my son's 12, um, he shot his first elk last year with a rifle and, and wanted shooting with a bow this year. We went out and only had one evening and one morning to archery hunt and got into a lot of action. In fact, probably one of the best uh, 24 hours of elk hunting on public land that I can remember uh, for as long as I've hunted. It happened to be his first archery hunt, so he's he's either spoiled or hooked. <laughs> I don't know which one it is. <laughs> um, but so we ended up, he didn't get one. We went out with a rifle because in Idaho, they've got a great program for youth that you can, uh, if you buy a, a A tag, which is essentially the archery tag, you can hunt all of the B season on that tag also. So he's able to go out and rifle hunt. And we got in there last week. It was the 22nd of October, public land, over-the-counter tag, very heavily hunted area. And we had two bulls bugling at daylight um, with other hunters around us. You know, there were a lot of people up in there. And he got over and actually missed a bull uh, first thing in the morning. He'll blame me, and I'll, I'll take responsibility for it. <laughs> I gave him the wrong distance by quite a bit. Um, it was a total guess, and outside 40 yards, I'm not that good. So yeah. <laughs> he missed three shots at it. The bull had 30 cows. They ran out of the canyon that we were in, over the ridge, and into the next canyon. And we got up there on the on the rock ledge overlooking that canyon, and I bugled twice, and that six-point bull came out. And this is, you know, six hours later, but he came out to investigate that call um, after he'd been shot at with a rifle just a few hours earlier three times. So, you know, I guess it, it really depends on the, the dynamics of the herd, the demographics, what they're doing, how many cows are there, um, if they're in their actual rutting area, if they're in their post-rut area. A lot of things just really play into effect there. And, and so I take it case by case if there's a bull there and i spook him and he runs off and he's still screaming his head off i'm going right back in after him yeah would you like possibly change angles or or just keep dogging him that's a great uh great question i would say again it depends but i i would probably want to give him a little bit of time so i'd probably Mm -hmm. back up and maybe come in you know from a different angle a little later or try to understand where they're going um yeah, you know, I, I, again, I don't have patience. So to sit on the hillside for six hours and nap and wait for <laughs> something, I'd probably hike out and go to a new drainage and hunt it for the evening. But yeah, I, th- I think once once you bust an elk, especially if they wind you, if they wind you, it's it's in their That's nostrils. Cool. They don't forget. And to just sit there and dog them, I think uh, it can happen, but the chances are pretty low. Yeah. Yeah, I saw the, I saw your son's uh, 
successful, huh? That's pretty awesome. I wanted to bring that up. Just what's been your experience with getting your children involved? Um, I mean, is that something that they've taken a natural interest into? And then obviously it's been more on the rifle side. Just practically, what has helped you get them involved? And even things specifically as like, you know, you got a youngster uh, with a rifle and, you know, you still need some power to put down an elk, like even practically, uh, what's a caliber choice? (laughs) My, uh, you know, and and I've got a really good perspective, um, differing perspective. I have three children. My oldest is 12 and he's been brainwashed since he, I mean, I have pictures of us sitting watching hunting videos when, you know, he was six months old. He's our only child at that point, and, you know, hunting's, I'm still able to get out and do a lot of hunting then, have more time, um, don't have kids in sports, all of that. And so he got a stronger dose of my passion for hunting, I think. And then as the second and the third one came along, you know, now we've got an older one in sports. I'm not getting out as much. Um, I don't have free time to just sit around and watch a hunting video every evening. All of those things, I think, uh, play a big effect into their interest and their passion and, and, you know, what that, as far as how they come through it naturally or come to it naturally. So my oldest is just a stone cold killer. He just, he is absolutely, he gets it. Archery hunting this year, I said, go sit up by that tree. He slipped down there. And after about 30 seconds, I see him, he's standing up and he's moving down the hill. And I thought, he's going to ruin it. You know, he's sit still when I tell you to sit still. And uh, so when I went up there after he had come to full draw four times on two different bulls, I said, buddy, what were you doing? He said, well, I just didn't have a good shooting lane where I was. So I moved down the hill 10 yards and had three different shooting lanes. So he gets it. You know, it's, it's natural. And, and he's thinking about those things at 12 years old. Where my other two, they love to do it. Um, they love to go out, but they aren't begging and tugging. Dad, can I please go out and, you know, shoot a ground squirrel in the backyard continually? For them, it takes a little bit more, um, I think forethought to just say, Hey, I've got to make sure they have a good experience. Isaac, who shot the bull last week, we hiked 16.6 miles in two days, including 6.3 miles of packing, which he, he amazed me. He's a tough, tough kid. Yeah, that's uh, My other two, it probably would have gave them a, a bad experience and they may not have been as anxious to go the next time. So it's, you know, you, you've got to do what your, what your children are comfortable with and take it at their pace and, that for me has been the hardest thing is to change my pace to, to match theirs. Yeah. That probably, maybe that wraps into the whole conversation about you becoming more patient. <laughs> <laughs> you think there's a, a master there's plan a here to help there. teach me a lesson? <laughs> yeah. Good thump over the head. <laughs> yeah. So, but no, you know, Isaac's, he, he loves hunting. Um, he's now shot two elk and a white tail with his rifle Um, he's there on archery. You know, like I said, he was at full draw during archery season on a 320 inch six point at 18 yards. He came to full draw and held it for about 40 seconds as the bull stood at 18 yards broadside. And I know the question going through your mind is why didn't he shoot? Um, I had told him before we went, I said, your maximum distance is 30 yards. So if you range something and it's 31 yards, you can't shoot. You Uh can use your 30 yard pin to shoot 30 yards, but there's no holdover. So I'm assuming, not to cut you off, but I'm assuming you didn't come by that arbitrarily, that you're watching him, watching what his accuracy does at ranges and things like that. Yeah, and he shot the adult stakes at all the 3D shoots we shot this summer. You know, he shot the Northwest Mountain Challenge, both of them, um, shot the adult stakes. And so he's shooting out to 60, 65 yards, and he's doing well. He's shooting 45 pounds, and he's dialed in. But there's that gap where he's shooting just absolute tight groups at 30 yards. And as he gets out to 40, he's still shooting really consistent, but there's that flyer. There's that yeah. you know, group start spreading a little more rapidly. And so rather than risk him wounding something his first time hunting with a bow, I put him inside that range. You know, I just said, hey, 30 yards is your max, and I know we'll have a good outcome if you get a shot at that distance. Right. So he climbed down. I mentioned, you know, he got up and moved. Well, when he first set up, he ranged a couple trees and there was a tree that was 33 yards. And he said, okay, if a bull comes in, it has to be on my side of that tree in order to shoot. Well, he moved down the hill 12, 15 yards and reset up. And that bull came in and stood at that tree. It wasn't in front of it. It was at it. And in his mind, he's thinking it's 33 yards. It's got to come three yards closer. Wow. 
and he just completely forgot to rearrange all of his landmarks when he moved down the hill, and it cost him a, a bull of a lifetime his first time archery hunting. Wow. That's a pretty amazing story, and that's pretty cool resolve of him to to stick to what you said and what he committed to. That's impressive. It, it is, and yeah, it's, you know, and I think it's, he, he realizes that he saw his groups expanding, and he knew where his, his realistic range was. He knew he could have made a shot at 40 yards and, and probably had a good outcome, but yeah, I was proud of him, and he had just incredible experiences. We had a, a blast. He about got ran over by a calf within 16 inches. It came barreling down the hill, and you know, so just those experiences, it was a successful hunt without a, without notching a tag for sure. Yeah. And then on the rifle side, uh, how, what do you have him set up with? <laughs> so I might catch a little slack for this. <laughs> He's shooting a 300 Winchester short mag. Wow. <laughs> and, nice. and that was his fault. That I took him out last year to the range with the 243 and I pulled it out and he looked at me kind of skeptical and he said, dad, isn't that mom's gun? <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's mom's gun, but you can shoot it. It's it'll be plenty to knock down an elk if we're within range. And he said, "Do you think I could shoot your gun?" And I'm thinking he's going to get scoped. He's going to get panic. He's going to close his eyes every time he squeezes the trigger. And I tried convincing him really hard not to shoot it. And he he wouldn't give in. So I set him up. We you know it was on sandbags. He had a good dead rest, and he was on a stool. And he shot, and it literally lifted him off the stool. And he took like three steps backwards, and I thought, all right, here come the tears. Get ready for this one. Yeah. And he turned around with a half grin on his face. He's like, can I do it again? <laughs> and so he's he considers it his gun. He loves his 300 wisdom, he calls it. And he <laughs> shot his bull last year, his, his whitetail last year, and his elk this year, all with the 300 short mag. Wow. That's cool. That's very cool. And then just another curious question. I'm... You know, my kids are like six and three, so I'm soaking up all this information on how to get them involved <laughs> and stuff like that. But um, when you guys were packing out that uh, elk this year, you mentioned 6.3 of it was loaded. What kind of load was he carrying? I mean, because I think personally anything, if he's carrying anything, is impressive. Yeah. So he shot it on Thursday evening. By the time we got it processed and, and quartered and everything, it was about 30 minutes after dark. We were in a nasty spot with a lot of blowdowns and actually had to navigate down through a bunch of rock bluffs and boulder fields. And so we decided to just go out completely empty rather than stumble around in the dark with the load. So at the end of the day, we were at 10.3 miles. The next morning we came in, we actually brought our mountain bikes and a trailer and were able to get just over a mile in there, like 1.2 miles uh, in on this closed gated logging road. So from there, we hiked in empty. We got to the elk. Uh, I opted to bone it out just to save us some weight. As we were doing it, I'm thinking, man, these quarters just, they don't feel as heavy as they did with the bone in. So I got pretty optimistic and a little aggressive again and thought we can bring this out in one trip. And anyone who's carried a hind quarter on an elk with or without the bone, it's its substantial. Mm -hmm. there's, there's some weight there. So as good as he had done on the hunt and and other backpacking trips we've been on, I loaded him up with a hind quarter and the skull and the antlers. Wow. And I don't know, you know, what it, what it actually weighed. I'm guessing the hind quarter was probably in the neighborhood of 50 to 55 pounds of, of boned out meat. And then the antlers and the, the skull, we left the lower jaw in there. Um, probably, you know, 25 pounds. So probably around 75 pounds. And I put it on him. And then I loaded the other three quarters and all the scrap meat boned out um, on my pack frame. And I could barely roll the pack frame over to get it, to get under it and stand up. And I did. And I lifted his up on him. And we went about 10 yards. He's like, Dad, I think there's something wrong with one of my muscles. And I, you know, I'm thinking, great, he pulled a muscle or something. I'm like, well, what's going on? He's like, it's just, it's burning. It's like it's tearing or it's on fire. And he pointed to it and I said, welcome to the, here, here's your introduction to hip flexors. <laughs> and you're going to, you're going to get well acquainted with your hip flexor over the next six hours. And so we, uh, we went about 30 more yards and he said, dad, I can't, I can't do this. So we dropped the antlers there and being the tough guy that I think that I am, I thought, well, I'm just going to power through this and, and get out of here with all of this load. 
And I made it probably another three quarters of a mile. And then the hind quarter got too much for him. So we dropped it and he carried uh, just the scrap meat, which was probably 35, 40 pounds um, on his pack frame. And I just carried the, the other three quarters. Uh, we made it out to the trailer and then I went back in and got the antlers in the quarter. He met me part way and carried the antlers back out. So, you know, you, you look at that and I get kind of spoiled because I have hunting partners that are pretty tough and they carry a lot of weight. And you get in with a 12 year old and it makes for a lot of work. Um, for a dad who's there trying to, trying to be the tough guy, it's, yeah. you aren't tough after an hour of packing three quarters on your back, even if they are boned out. Yeah. That's no joke. So we made, it was about a little over a mile, probably a mile and a quarter of actual straight distance packing of the weight. And what would that be? Two of those full trips were with with on back. So he packed basically three miles with weight on his back. Yeah. That was the first number I had in my mind. It's like, even if he's carrying like 35 pounds, that's impressive, you know? Yeah. And the terrain. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, and he did. He did good. He could have handled that hind quarter, but there were so many blowdowns and brush that we were wading through that after he fell face first downhill with his arms pinned under him and he couldn't get up, he, he <laughs> said, "Dad, this is too much." <laughs> uh, we've all been there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> well, that's cool. So that I mean, that's a pretty awesome opportunity that they have in Idaho then to get the archery tag, but then that's just for the youth then to continue to hunt that B season. It is. Yeah. So adults basically have to choose between the A and the B tag and it splits the seasons up and it gives priority. The A tag gives priority to, to more of the archery season and the B tag is more focused on the rifle for the youth. And in the zone that we were hunting, there's the archery season, the whole month of September for any elk there's a spike rifle season for 10 days after the archery season for rifle. There's a rifle any bull season for three weeks after the spike season. And then there's a cow muzzleloader hunt for a couple of weeks uh, in November. So for opportunity for youth getting them out there, there's there's really no excuse. There's plenty of time and opportunity in, in Idaho to get the youth involved. Yeah. So just real quick, you, you mentioned that was like on the 22nd or so of October. Is that right? Yeah, we could go today. Yeah. So what are the big differences uh, between September 22nd to now October 22nd, late October, even for those guys who, you know, might still have a tag? I mean, obviously, we know that things change in terms of, you know, you get heavy snow, they could go lower elevation. Um, you know, the rut is the peak of the rut certainly um, past. So what kind of maybe two or three specifics of the way that your hunting changes from September 22nd to October 22nd. Yeah, you know, and I mentioned at the beginning that I'm a student of of elk hunting, and when it comes to rifle hunting, I am like a flunking student who <laughs> is, <laughs> is needing tutoring and all sorts of help. I just, I haven't rifle hunted, and the reason why, it's it's probably a little bit of laziness, but it's tough. Your rifle hunting is basically just going out and wandering around until you see something, and then you shoot it. Whereas archery, I can use a bugle and I can tell you right away if there's something there I want to hunt, just whether they respond or not. So rifle hunting has been, there's been a learning curve there of trying to figure out what the elk are doing, what strategies we can use to be more consistent in finding them. And fortunately, like I mentioned this time, there were t- there were two bulls bugling in the drainage we were in uh, a week ago this morning, which made it really easy. We knew there were elk there, we knew there were bulls there, and honestly with the rifle in hand all you got to do is just get close enough to them to see them and that's what we did uh in the morning anyway and i uh, i had made a mistake and dropped my backpack with my range finders in them as we heard the bull bugle to slide down and get closer and we ended up going about 300 yards closer and then saw the bull and realized i didn't have my range finders so i made a guess on the distance and i was off by about 50 percent and <laughs> it makes a big difference uh, yeah yeah so, so if those bulls, uh, if those bulls weren't talking, uh, I, again, I know you don't want to probably even say because you don't, don't necessarily have the ton of experience. But what was your strategy if you didn't yeah. have elk talking? I mean, because you know, obviously, you talk about archery season. A lot of times, you talk about you know finding you know north facing dark timber things like that. So what was your strategy? We're going to this area. If they're not talking, we're going to do blank. Yeah. So archery season, I hunt 
primarily thicker timber. I like the north facing slopes, you know, where the elk are, we're in tight with the elk. Uh, a lot of people like to arch hunt out in the open and, and, you know, that's effective as well. But I like the timber. With rifle hunting, though, especially when they aren't bugling, that's, that's tough. That's still hunting like on the ground for whitetail type hunting after the rut for an elk. So my, my first strategy is get in an area where I have a lot of vantage points. Uh, this particular area was really high. We were up at the level between the timber and the, the rock bluff. So kind of that subalpine stuff. Um, so really open plus a burn had gone through there. So even the timber down below was spotty burned. So we could, we had a lot of visibility there. So that's my number one, find an area that I can, that I can see that I can glass, that I can use my optics and, and spot elk. And then number two is cover country, you know, just get on a big ridge that has a lot of vantage points and just start walking. And, you know, I can't, like you said, there's so many factors, elk migration, where the rut is, where the rut was, um, how many cows are in there, if the rut's still going on, all of that. I really didn't have a clue, you know, so we went to an area that I'd archery hunted. I knew there had been elk in there in the past, and we literally, the first time he shot at that bull um, that morning, we were set up within 60 yards of, of where a buddy of mine had missed an elk a couple seasons ago during archery season. So, um, you know, learning for me that, that said, Hey, we can go back to areas we archery hunt and find elk during rifle season. Um, might be a little more selective on the train and, and vantage points and all that, but they're at least still in that same general area, at least mid October. I think once November hits and you get a little bit of snow, then it changes pretty drastically sometimes. Yeah, for sure. So we touched on the youth opportunities in Idaho and Idaho's known, even especially from my perspective as a non-resident for being very friendly in terms of it's easy even for non-residents to get over the counter tags, but something that's came up and some proposed changes around the whole point system. Can you kind of talk about what, what's going on in Idaho there? You really want to go there? <laughs> we do. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how you uh, really feel, Corey. <laughs> my, uh, go ahead. You've done a lot of research on this in the past, right? I have, yeah. In yeah. fact, you know, I'm I'm passionate about it because I, I think you know I'm looking to, to the future and the next generation of hunters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a. I don't know if we have enough time to to discuss everything involved, but Idaho has no point system right now, so it's a pure, true lottery draw system. So. Um, Someone from, you know, non-residents have a different, they have a, a limited pool that they're drawing sure. from, but someone who's been putting in for 40 years has the same chance as someone who puts in the first year. And you see it every year. Some 13-year-old girl draws the premium elk or deer tag in the state of Idaho, and the guy who lives in the unit has been putting in for 30 years starts screaming, it's, you know, injustice, it's unfair, and I want bonus points so I can draw my favorite tag. And I really look at it as... The only real argument for having bonus points is selfishness. And I use that very much with a grain of salt. I don't mean, you know, somebody's nece necessarily selfish, but the motivation to say we want a bonus point system is self interest. Improve my odds and give me a better chance than someone else of drawing. And I can see the argument that, hey, if I've put in for 10 years, I'm loyal to this. I should be rewarded to, to some degree. The problem and the thing that, that I think is the biggest oversight, especially for those who are proponents of it, is that it doesn't really increase your chances of drawing um, on those really hard-to-draw units. Uh, for, for instance, if you have a, a hunt, and this is off of several years ago uh, statistics from Idaho, but there's a specific elk unit that had 15 tags, and there were 500 applicants for it. So without a bonus point system... You know, we're looking at 3% draw odds somewhere in there. If you go to, there's a bunch of different systems, and, you know, that's the thing is people are like, well, we don't want just necessarily a straight bonus point. We could do this. You've got the Nevada-style system where they uh, square your bonus points. You've got Utah where they give half people preference, half people or half tags preference, half tags bonus, all sorts of different programs. But the bottom line is... Um, they really don't work in those really hard to draw units. If somebody gets in on the ground level in that specific one I talked about, so 3% draw odds, someone gets in ground level, no more people jump into the pool, just the, the number of applicants that there's been. Um, by year number two, 
someone who is brand new would have a 0.6% chance of drawing, but the max point holder who has two points would have a 3.07% chance. Wow. Five years later, the person who's getting in right then for the first time would have a 0.13% chance of drawing that tag, and a max point holder would have a 3.26% chance. So after five years of being a max point holder, you went from a 3% draw to 326 now, I don't see that it's worth 0.26 of a percent increase in drawing to punish someone who's getting into it by decreasing their odds by 1,800%. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking, you know, for my children who are coming up in five years, who are going to be putting in for, for a hunt under this system, they would have no statistical chance of, of ever drawing that tag. You look at a state like Oregon, and they've got, you know, the Wenaha unit that gives one tag to a non-resident every other year. There are, I forget, I don't have numbers, but just, you know, throwing out there, whether it's 60 or 100 people with max points, it's going to take 120 years to get through the people with max points to draw that tag. So then what happens? All those people who have max points start trickling down into the next hunt. You know, the Walla Walla, the Mount Emily, some of those, you know, better hunts that now takes 17, 18 points because all these max point people are jumping in there. So somebody getting in right now, or even someone with 10 points has no statistical chance of drawing that tag in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. So then you get into the three point hunts that, you know, used to take three points to draw. Now they take 10 or 12 points and someone getting in at the ground level has no chance of drawing that. So it's just, it's a trickle that punishes anyone who's not in the draw system right now. Is there any, uh, I'm not too familiar with all the different systems, but is there a, any system out there where there isn't point creep, where uh, you know ten years down the road, twenty years down the road, it becomes impossible to get the tag? Uh, no, to, no. to me, if you, I mean, if you got you know so many people putting in and only so many tags going out, that number is just going to continue to grow and grow and grow, and it's going to become Oregon, where it's twenty years, thirty years, zero percent chance of getting the tag. I, I just don't understand how people look at that system and think it's going to work in the long run. Yeah, and it, like I said, it comes down, and, and I don't mean this as an insult to those who want a point system, but it's it's the selfishness, the what can I do to get myself a tag in a good unit? And yeah, it's you know you look at 10% draw odds, statistically, yeah, your odds are going to go up to 12%, to 14%, 16% over the long haul. But again, the, the big piece of it that we're missing here is if you have 100 people putting in for a prime elk tag, and there's no bonus points. That means if they don't draw, they've bought a license in Idaho for 150 bucks or whatever it is for a non-resident now. They've bought that license. They have to either buy a $400 elk tag to go hunting or they've just wasted that money because they didn't draw the tag that they wanted. There are fewer people that are going to take that chance and put in. If you go to a point system, it's going to pull thousands and thousands of people into this system now that want to get in on the ground level. So mm -hmm. not only are you taking your 3% draw odds and only increasing them to 3.26 in five years, you're probably realistically cutting those odds in half by going to a bonus point system because there's going to be a lot more people jump in. Um, another thing that, you know, in Idaho, you can either apply for elk, deer, and antelope, or you can apply for one of the once in a lifetime. So if you apply for moose in Idaho, you cannot put in the controlled hunt system for elk, deer, antelope, any of those, one of the proposals they had was that you could buy a point for every species. So if you were to do that, now you're taking these people who, oh, wow. are, who are, you know, very specific on what they're applying for and saying you can buy points. So they may not be applying every year, but if you look at the number of points that are going to be there in 10 years, it's, it's just a, a major debacle that we're not going to be able to dig ourselves out of once we get down the road. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's I mean, kind of, that's kind of how Colorado is. And I have, having hunted there and having played the points game, that's, that's what I've had to do. I mean, you pretty much, you know, even if you weren't going to elk hunt in Colorado, you could pretty much just straight up buy a species point and just yeah. bank those. And it's all per species. Um, you don't have to, and really the cost of it is, you know, low, you don't have to buy a license. There's a fee to do it, but it's reasonable. But yeah, I mean, it, like you said, it, it just completely floods the system with, with points. It does. Yeah. And so, yes, it's not, uh, I hate to use the word fair because that's, it's 
so suggestive and interpreted by, yeah, by individuals. But, you know, I sit there and say it's not fair to have bonus points because my kids coming up are going to have way less of a chance of drawing a tag than someone else that same year. Um, but the guys that want bonus points are saying it's not fair that I put in for 10 years and somebody who's never put in before draws the tag. I, I can see both sides of the argument, but what I can see very clearly is the negative ramifications of implementing a bonus point system in a state like Idaho that manages their game for opportunity, not for trophy. Um, you know, and so I guess what brings this up and what makes it current right now is the Idaho Fishing Game has an open survey on their website asking people, what are your thoughts on bonus points? And there's nothing proposed, but I believe this is the fourth time in the last five years that we've had to fight the fight and go out and, you know, Idaho's... Uh, game laws and, and some of these things such as bonus points, auction tags, all of that are dictated at the state government level. So it's a legislator that's actually uh, implementing these and, and bringing these up. Uh, so it's it's difficult because you're arguing with, with politics. They attach some of these to other bills that make sense and they get pushed through. And so educating the public to be able to say, hey, call your commissioner and talk to them, call your legislator, talk to them. Um, let them know how you feel about it. It really carries a lot of weight. And hunters were so sometimes passive about some of these political and conservative things that we don't get involved in. All it takes is a couple of of guys that think that they're going to get a whole bunch more tags or we get auction tags. We're going to be able to buy a tag anywhere they want because they've got more money. Um, you know, it just takes a couple of them pushing something through and pretty soon the rest of us are, are playing their games. So yeah. I guess I would just say, get involved, you know, take that survey, let them know we like Idaho manage for opportunity and not to say there's not trophy potential here, but I think that my opinion and, and the facts of, of percentages and draws and all of that support that bonus points are really going to hurt down the road. They're going to hurt everyone down the road. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the, the, you know, the simple fact that it's made at the legislative level, potentially again by non-hunters, Introducing a point system could certainly generate more revenue than not having a point system does Absolutely. currently. Absolutely. And so if it's simply made at a political level, you know, of, of course, they're, they're, should we make more money or not? You know, and ultimately, <laughs> totally. I mean, you know, that that can be a massive influencer. So, yeah, unless unless, you know, you don't want to see that happen, I, I would speak up for sure. Yeah, well, it's that. Go ahead, Steve. Sorry. That's a, one thing on that survey I saw that I actually really liked was the, you know, every other year, what was it right now? If you draw a rifle tag, you can not put in the following year, but then you know, after that, but possibly just that two to three year gap if you draw a tag. And then there was another question on there, right, about um, doing it like they what you do with the trophy species where I believe you put in for goats too, right? I put in for moose this year, but yeah, I put oh. in usually for once in a lifetime. Yeah, and I mean, I always loved that, you know, I had a 10% chance to draw my go tag. I mean, that's a really good opportunity. You're not going to find a, a state anywhere where you're going to have that kind of odds to draw a goat tag. And it's because you can only put in for that one specific thing. And I, I couldn't put in for, if everybody every year could put in for goat, moose, sheep, elk, deer, antelope, the odds would be terrible. So, um, yeah. And even I, if they yeah. couldn't put in, even if they could just buy points, it would still kill the odds because now you've got 100 people with max points and... You're always chasing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, and that brings up, you know, the point of uh, the point of points. But, um, you know, going to either longer wait or um, single species applications, things like that, it's definitely going to increase the, the draw percentages. But again, people in Idaho are accustomed to, I can put in for deer, elk, antelope, bear, and I can put in for a super tag for moose. You know, there's a lot of opportunity for some pretty darn good tags that you can pretty openly apply for. And I think they feel like they're losing. So they want, you know, they want their cake and they want to eat it too. It's, we've got to compromise. We've got to look at it and say, what's best long term? Am I willing to say, I really want to draw a trophy elk tag in the state of Idaho? Am I willing to give up putting in for anything else to have that chance, knowing that I can still go and buy an over-the-counter tag and go hunting if I don't draw? I just see, you know, the, the dollar sign spinning right now, and they say, all right, we take the whatever there were, 45,000 applicants for elk hunts in 2010 in, in Idaho. 
we take that and charge double or triple for it, that's great. That's a little pool of money. But if we take the other 50 or 100,000, however many you know elk licenses they sell in a year, take that and put everything on a draw you know even if it's a liberal whole bunch of points but now everything's a draw you have to apply for what is now an over-the-counter tag that's going to be bringing a lot more revenue it's going to be hard for them to say let's not do this they're going to they're going to implement that and then that's where we start losing out as sportsmen that's where you know opportunity Mm -hmm. gets really cut off Mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah that's all that just that math that that you mentioned and what what the odds how they actually increase or how little they increase is fascinating and then that i can give you another example so that's for a three percent draw hunt um if you take another one that say is 30 percent so there's a there's a hunt here that has 225 rifle tags 783 applicants that's 29 percent chance of drawing um with a nevada style bonus point system after two years, someone who puts in for the first time, their their chance of drawing would be 7.5%. So, you know, it's that 25% reduction in, in their draw odds. Um, someone with max points, though, is up to 37% chance, almost one in three chance. By year five, someone getting in would have a 3% chance of drawing that year, and a max point holder would have a 90% chance. So when you get up to that 30% um, draw odd range, it starts making a little bit more sense that after five years, yeah, you're you're having a chance of drawing. And then maybe we say we have a three-year wait or a five-year wait if you draw, you know, a tag like that. Mm-hmm. Um, then it clears them out, and I think it can work. But for those under 20% drawed hunts, it's it's not a winning combination to have a point system there for mm-hmm. anyone other than those who get in on ground level. Yeah, yeah, I think it's interesting too, just the way that you know, guys game the system. I know that one, one of the changes Colorado made, uh, relatively, relatively recently is that, you know, if you, like, again, f- from a non-resident perspective, I, in years past could just keep, you know, buy a species point every year. I'm just going to get an elk point. You know, it's not tied to any specific unit. I don't even have to buy a license. I don't have to buy a tag, nothing. And I could do that for 15 years in a row. Never step foot in Colorado, but they've changed that now to where, you either have to apply for a hunt or purchase a tag in X number of years. I forget what the number of years is, but it basically keeps people from only buying points and not actually participating. Mm. And so, you know, it's just, a, again, another example of when you start to introduce those points, um, you know, you're going to have to introduce even more rules, more regulations, more complications to then try and ungame the game yeah and so yeah it just it, it definitely complicates things for sure yeah there's no there's no trial period there's no turning back once you go down that road you've got 150,000 people that are invested in this program you can't just pull that carpet out or it'll be <laughs> there'll be anarchy yeah, yeah. Huh. well cool so switching gears uh one thing i definitely wanted to cover just um with you Corey, is sort of how your roles have changed in the last year. Um, I'm sure most of our listeners are familiar with Extreme Elk Magazine, whether or not they know that you're the man behind that. But kind of talk about, you know, Elk 101 tra- transitioning to Extreme Elk and then now kind of this making this other transition and uh, where you've been and where things are going. For sure. No, and that's, you know, my, my wife would probably... Uh, define it as I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up and there's probably some truth to that but you know I've just I've been blessed with with a lot of really cool opportunities Um, I've got a degree in engineering uh, worked in as a mechanical engineer for several years and started a construction business and have always had a passion for hunting and so actually uh, what was it 2007 2008 started elk101.com just kind of as an outlet to share my passion for elk hunting, to um, maybe share some some tips and tactics with those who are going through the learning curve, um, whether they're new elk hunters, whether they're experienced elk hunters, you know, just trying to make a place where just the regular guy fits in, um, whether it's trying to learn, whether it's just watching an elk hunting film, you know, they're, they want to be entertained and they love elk hunting. 
um, a forum to be able just all these different things to bring elk hunters together. And we ran that for several years and, and loved it. Had, you know, added a retail store, which, which went really well. Um, but then somewhere along the line, we thought, you know, we've got the digital side covered. Nobody's doing anything on the print side uh, with an elk magazine other than Bugle, which, you know, theirs is more of a conservation-based model. Um, we wanted to a uh, model that fit with Elk 101 as a magazine. So uh, when I say we, my hunting partner, Dirk Durham, and I got together and conjured up this idea for a, a DIY public land elk hunting magazine, and we called it Extreme Elk just because... We couldn't think of anything else cool to call it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they both the website and the magazine were very well received, uh, took off really well, and became a lot of work, quite frankly. You know, I mean, it just, it, it was a lot to manage, both of them. So last year in 2014, I uh, had an opportunity to sell Elk 101. And the purpose of that was just to free up more time to be able to focus on the magazine because I felt like I was bouncing back and forth between the two. And uh, with, with Elk 101 sold to Camo Fire, uh, we, we were able to focus strictly on the magazine, and it worked great. We grew it over the, the next 12 months. And just the way timing works and everything, uh, we had an opportunity to sell Extreme Elk magazine uh, in July of this year to Elk Hunter magazine, which coincidentally, they had the same idea we did uh, back four and a half years ago. And we launched our magazines without even having buzz of each other doing anything, launched them on the exact same weekend in August of 2011. Um, so we, we've been competitors, good relationship there and everything. And so when the opportunity came to kind of merge together, um, basically take Extreme Elk Magazine and fold it into Elk Hunter Magazine, it just, it made sense. And at the same time, there was an opportunity to be uh, more involved in ownership of Elk 101 again. And so I've kind of stepped in there and, and got content back on track and doing some fun things with Elk 101 on the digital front, still involved with Elk Hunter as far as a contributing writer and uh, kind of getting to live the best of both worlds there and, and, uh, still playing in the elk hunting industry. Yeah, that's cool. So you had one, and then you had both, and then you had the other one. Now you're back to both, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> both, neither, yeah. It's, yeah, uh, yeah there, there's involvement there on both of them at different levels, for sure. Yeah, so what does, um, obviously, you know, Extreme Elk got wrapped into Elk Hunter. What does the future of that magazine look like, and how will you continue to be involved? Yeah, so I'm... I'm involved there for the long haul. Um, it's a great magazine. It's, you know, very similar to Extreme Elk Magazine as far as just a passion for for do-it-yourself type elk hunting. You know, whether that's sharing tips and tactics or just, you know, the edge or the entertainment part of it, just sharing adventures. Um, they do a great job. Uh, elk Hunter Magazine is owned by, it's you know, Western Hunter Elk Hunter Magazine. So they've got a, they've been around in the magazine industry a long time. Um, they're set up. They have a staff of of people that contribute to that. Whereas with Extreme Elk, you know, it was it was me running the show, grinding every day, putting stuff together, marketing, doing kind of all of that, and it's it's difficult. So now the all of that weights off me. I can just write cool content and and share my passion for elk hunting through the writing there, and and continue to be involved at that level, uh, as well as. You know, be able to kind of direct the the content on Elk 101 at the same time. Yeah. So your involvement awesome. with Elk 101 is kind of continue to be on that content front. Yeah. So that's you know, the retail side, Camofire and those guys, they have that down. That's their forte. Um, the content side is is where more of my passion and interest lies, and so it's a good fit there for me to jump in and kind of take the reins on the content and kind of direct that a little more. Yeah. Cool. So did you guys um, film any of your hunts this fall? Because, I mean, are you working on any projects for Elk 101 or maybe the Full Draw Film Tour again? Anything like that that you can share? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we uh, we did. We filmed Wyoming. A uh, good friend of mine, John Abernathy, went and basically just followed us around. I forget how many miles we did and the few days he was there, but we made sure that his feet were sore when he left. And uh, he captured some incredible footage. Uh, I won't 
do too much of a spoiler, but if you've seen the picture that I posted on Facebook of me at full draw with a bull there, that's the bull I ended up shooting. And it was incredibly exciting. Uh, it's a, maybe a controversial shot. It'll be a lot of fun to, uh, to get some discussion going on on a, you know, a later hey. date, maybe when that footage <laughs> yeah. is available. We, we've already um, raised some controversy, so... Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> and, you know, I think maybe more than controversy, education, showing, you know, what proper knowledge of anatomy and execution of shots, you know, is capable of. Um, and for anybody that's left wondering what we're talking about, it's the frontal shot. And it's, in my opinion, a very devastating shot. And I won't hesitate if the conditions are right. And in this case, it was eight yards frontal and it was... The, the results speak for themselves in the video, but um, yeah, so we got that. Then I actually went and hunted in Montana uh, with a good friend of mine, Randy Newberg, and he had his camera guy there filming it for his TV show, which is Fresh Tracks with Randy Newberg. Uh, and then we've done some other really cool projects, uh, video projects that we're working on for some bigger stuff with Elk 101 that's going to be coming out next year. Uh, so yeah, a lot of a lot of cool video, film, digital stuff, different projects that we're working on, for sure. All centered around elk hunting. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, I don't want to continue to stir the controversy, but going back to frontal <laughs> real quick. <laughs> um, you know, I've heard different um, claims on, you know, the window, quote unquote, the window that you have to make that shot being something from... You know, most guys will say it's like softball size. Um, is that kind of your feelings on it um, in terms of th the way that you need to place an arrow there for that shot? Is Not that how much all. margin you think you have? No, no. It's, it's you huge. know, I've heard the same thing. You've got to thread a needle. You've got a softball-sized hole there. Um, you know, the placement, people will tell you right where the transition from dark to light is down on that lump on the throat. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of misconception and misinformation about that. And, you know, I think people who have had a bad experience with a frontal shot either shoot too far off to the side on a straight-on shot and they get between the rib cage and the shoulder blade. They get good blood for a while, but then they don't find it. And that's because the arrow didn't even make it into the body cavity. Or they shoot low and hit that brisket, you know, right at the sternum there where the ribs come together. And that's pretty hard to break through even at close range with an arrow. So, you know, you get a lot of blood off of that brisket shot, but then you end up tracking it and the blood quits. And those are really the, the two primary mistakes I think people make with that shot. Um, you know, if that bull's quartering slightly towards me just a little bit, I'll take that shot all day. You just have to know where that leg bone and the shoulder blade come down in there. Um, but there's still plenty of room to get into both lungs. Uh, straight on frontal, you've got, you know, somebody, if you know the anatomy of that elk and the arteries and the veins that are running through that elk's throat, everything that supplies oxygen to the brain is coming from the heart right through that channel. And if you go through there, get that, get lungs, get heart, get, you know, my arrow this year went all the way through and stuck in the back hip on the off side of the elk. Um, and so that put my knock about in the center of his lungs, um, <laughs> rolling around there. So he didn't make it 40 yards in, in the video. He yeah. falls over right there in, on my shoulder, basically. Um, yeah, it's devastating. And so to, to answer your question about the size of the hole you have there, if you look at an elk straight on and look where those leg bones come up and then flare back into the shoulder blade, you know, I won't give a dimension necessarily right now. We've, we've got a project we're working on that will very clearly give a dimension on that. But you've got 12 to 16 inches there, depending on the size and how high up you get on that animal. Um, and I'm talking in the, in the X dimension, horizontal dimension, vertically. You know, you've got, you've got a good spread there. So, I, you know, I, it comes down to your comfort level, your, your knowledge level of the anatomy, your comfort in your shot, your, your confidence in your abilities. There are people that I wouldn't want shooting at an elk broadside at 20 yards right. um, compared to people that I know that I'd rather have them shoot a, a front. You know, I know guys that can consistently pull off a frontal shot at 30 yards far better than, dare I say, the majority of archery hunters at 20 yards on a broadside elk. Yeah. Yep. You, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, it's like you said, when it's done correctly, it's absolutely devastating. Yep. Um, and certainly we're not advocating that everyone do it. But I think the That's, point is yep. and the point that you're making is if you 
if you take the time to do the research and understand the anatomy, understand the angles and know where you need to place it, and then obviously keep a close eye on distance, that it's doable for sure. Yep. Do you have, just again, wandering offhand, do you have a sort of a personal comfort range number in mind where you feel it's um, kind of your own your own limit for a frontal shot? And obviously there's factors such as the alert state of the animal and things like that, but... Totally. Yeah, you know, and it, there are so many factors, and, and that's a whole other discussion on ethical shot distances, long-range shooting, all of that, and I think ultimately at the end of the day, it comes down to your level of confidence that you aren't going to wound an animal, and it's no different than taking a broadside shot. You know, if you make yeah. a bad shot on a frontal elk, it's no different than a shoulder blade or a gut shot on a broadside elk. Um, you know, I, I do agree that there is a greater margin um, for error on a broadside shot. And I'll take, I would prefer a broadside shot all day, absolutely. But I don't think that I'm being desperate or that I am being unethical or anything by taking a frontal shot either if I'm confident in it and, and know that anatomy and, and confident in my range. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, and this year's a perfect example. I, I, in my mind, said I'm holding out for a six by six bull or bigger in Wyoming. I'm not a trophy hunter. I'm not a snob hunter. But I wanted to shoot a six by six bull. That was I knew that we were in an area that had them. Didn't have to be a certain score or anything. But my my goal was a six point. I had one exception, and that was if there was a camera over my shoulder, if the bull was inside ten yards, and if he was frontal. I wanted to get a frontal shot on video. You know, a, a, not a obscured vision type one, but a clear, clean. You can see where it hits. You can see the devastating results. And this bull was a five by five that I shot, but I shot him at eight yards. Um, it was just perfect. And it, it was the exact result that I could have uh, only hoped to, to have happen from it. So as far as, as range, I would say 20 yards, anything outside 20 yards, uh, there's going to have to be a whole lot of positive con- conditions for me to say, yeah, I'm, I can stretch that a little farther on the frontal. And it's not because I'm not confident in it, but a bull elk can whirl awful fast. And if he's coming in and here's that shot, he can easily whirl enough that you're hitting shoulder or shoulder blade um, outside 20 yards. Yeah. I think it's interesting, too, just thinking about the practical aspects of, I think, particularly if you hunt elk solo, you need to consider the frontal even more or at least be even more prepared Um to make that decision just on the simple fact of, especially if you're hunting solo and calling, it just seems like you have a much greater chance of an elk coming directly in towards you versus obviously a scenario where you can drop a collar back or downwind and try and, you know, catch them circling. So you guys that hunt solo, it seems like that's definitely something to consider. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you're calling, that elk's usually coming straight into you, and so it's tough to, to get a broadside shot. And it's it's possible there are things you can do, and this one actually, Dirk was calling for me, and he was, we were set up perfect. I had a broadside shot at 30 yards, and the bull came up, and I was at full draw, and just as he was basically getting fully broadside to get a shot, um, he stepped on a stick, and it kind of startled him, and he turned straight at me and decided to circle around downwind of where Dirk was calling from, and basically came straight into my lap that way, and... So yeah, it's, I think it just, if you're prepared for it and confident in it, it can add another element um, that brings you a little bit closer towards success. Yeah. Awesome. Was there anything else you guys wanted to cover? Corey on, uh, I was just curious, you were talking about grizzlies versus hunter population and the the elk, you know, responding accordingly. Do you see any difference in their, uh, them being vocal or not between hunting pressure and Natural predators? Uh, I think any pressure, whether it's predator or or hunter, two-legged or four-legged predator, um, has an effect on an elk's willingness to be vocal. But, you know, I say that, and it's, it's again, very uh, area by area. You go to Arizona where there's maybe a ton of people running around. Those elk are very vocal. They're used to that Mm -hmm. um, pressure maybe or that that exposure and, and... just having that interaction with, with humans. Um, you come to Idaho or Montana or Wyoming or something, it seems like if you get predators in there, those elk go quiet pretty quickly, whether it's humans or, or others. Um, in Wyoming, I think there was a high enough population of, 
of bulls and a low enough population of cows that the bulls were very responsive and very vocal, especially mm. early in the season. Mm -hmm. Up in Montana, there was a much lower number of bulls, still a low number of cows, but a very low number of bulls. And there was some hunting pressure, but there was uh, there were tracks of grizzlies and wolves and black bears and <laughs> cougars. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there was the, the perfect storm of predators there. And the elk were very shy. You know, just getting them to talk, you could get an answer out of them. But mm -hmm. getting in close and keeping them communicating and just getting in those screaming matches with them, it took a lot more work. And even, you know, working in, we had to work elk for four or five hours sometimes, pushing them, getting in right setups, continuing following them, moving them around this, you know, base and whatever it was, really playing cat and mouse with them to to get them to, into bow range. Whereas okay. Wyoming, it seemed like you get in close and set up and... And it's going to happen. happen. Yeah. I just remember where I used to elk hunt here in Idaho when the wolves got really bad. I mean, it used to go from hearing bugles every day to like there was two years where we heard like one or two bugles the entire season. Yep. And I thought it was just interesting that the wolves had that much of an impact versus hunting pressure you think would shut them up as well. But Yeah. And I've seen, I've, I've seen firsthand, you know, two bulls fighting in a meadow. We're trying to make a play on them, not calling, you know, just trying to work in on them. They're screaming cows all over, going crazy. And wolves started howling up on the hillside. Those elk pulled apart from fighting. The cows went quiet and they all sat there and fed for an hour and a half until dark without another bugle, without any more aggression. It was almost like they just completely came out of the rut when the, when the wolves started howling. Wow. And a couple of years later in that same area, we could see six bulls up this drainage with binoculars and spotting scope. We had six different bulls within, you know, earshot. We should have been able to hear them bugle. And we couldn't get a peep out of any of them until we got within about 75 yards of one. And he just made a real low, just, oh, was all he would say. And he had like nine or 10 cows. Um, and there were wolves all over in there. We went down the, down the drainage about seven miles and up into another canyon. And the elk were screaming in there. So it's... Yeah, they, they know that a bugle's a dinner bell when there's a pack of wolves in there. Mm. That, that brings up a, another topic of, I've, I've ran into this in the past, so I'm, I'm curious if you have too, of just literally moving five miles, you know, like opening week in September and, and hunting and bulls are like, I, this was a few years ago, like hunted the opening day, didn't hear a freaking bugle. Day three, we hiked out of that country, went five miles down the road, elk were freaking screaming, you know, and it's kind of, it's interesting because you talk to guys all over the state of, you know, people complain that the rut's not happening and it's hot <laughs> weather and, you know, all we did was move five miles and bam, you know, it's kind of, you have any theory or is it just there's, there happened to be a, a cow in heat in that area or why would, why would five miles make a difference? You know, I, I probably don't have a theory, but I definitely have a strategy and that's exactly what you said. I will not wear out an area if the elk aren't responding there. I will I will pull up after one day and go to a new area just because the time is so limited. I know there's an elk somewhere in that unit that's responding and mm -hmm. I'm going to go and find him. I'm not going to waste time in an area for my precious week of elk hunting vacation chasing elk that aren't responding or aren't in the rut or that are just limiting my success with my style of hunting. So being mobile and just going, finding elk, covering a lot of country and going to new areas without really getting stuck in that rut is is important as far as you know the reason why in theory on that yeah it's it's different you have a cow that's there and there's six bulls and one cow the bulls are probably going to be fired up a little bit more mm -hmm. trying to fight for that one cow um, you go to an area where there's one bull and 30 cows that bull's probably not going to be talking early on you know and maybe he will be who you know there's there's yeah. a lot of different dynamics there that I haven't taken the time to figure out. All I figured out is I need to leave and find one that is bugling. <laughs> gotcha. I'm curious, Corey, on that point of, you know, you have, say, a week in Wyoming or wherever, and, and you don't waste any time. You know, you get in there, they're not responding. You said even sometimes a day, um, if you're not getting responses, you might pick up and move on. How are you working that from a logistics perspective in terms of do you pack in with gear to stay X number of days knowing that? you might then come out just after one day or are you staying closer to a trailhead with your camp and supplies so that you can be uh, quicker and more mobile? How do you sort of balance the logistics of this area we're headed to might be hot and we might be here for three, four, five days, or we might be moving tomorrow. And so to not waste time um, 
covering ground and, and handling the logistics. Kind of what, what's your strategy and game plan with that? Yeah. And that's, um, you know, something that I think I've, I've delved into one extreme, the other extreme and kind of, I've, I've found that balance point for me is one to five miles from the road. Um, you know, get back in far, much farther than that and we've done it, but it just seems like you get back there and if there is a pack of wolves or if there's another camp set up, you're committed at that point. That's a day to get in there, a day out, a day to hunt and figure it out. You know, of my seven or eight days of hunting, three of them are wasted right there. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I, I have found the times that I've went back deep like that haven't been great experiences as far as being able to mobily find elk and have several pockets of elk, which I really feel it takes to have, you know, you need several opportunities to, to capitalize and be successful on a consistent basis. Um, when you get back deep like that, and there are definitely exceptions, there are areas where, you know, people get back in there, whether it's five miles or 12 miles or 26 miles, that they're alone and the elk are, they're a different elk that they're hunting. They're just much more susceptible to, to calling. But for me, I found that that mix that area a mile off the road, you eliminate a lot of people. Um, you'll still bump into people from time to time, but you're you're in a in a position that you can easily back out in two or three hours or four hours, be back at the truck, and drive ten miles to the next drainage and still hike in two or three miles for an evening hunt, um, and really f- you know find that specific pocket of elk that I'm looking for. You know with a with a bull that's fired up and and ready to come running into the calls. So that's been kind of my, in fact, the area we went in Wyoming this year, looking on Google Earth, all of our research and everything said, this is a bivy hunt area. So we took our bivy packs. We were ready. I mean, we literally had packs loaded with everything so we could grab them and go bivy hunting at the drop of a hat. Um, we did 14 miles one day on the GPS back in there. And even doing that kind of distance, I didn't feel like I was going to be more effective bivy hunting. And part of it comes to my patients. You know, bivy hunting, I just feel like I spend a little more time sitting, setting up a camp, coming back to that camp. Um, middle of the day, it seems like there's more downtime when I'm bivy hunting. Um, and so I just felt like we were more effective this year, even if we had to do 10, 12, 14 miles a day, which I think we averaged a little over 10 miles a day. Doing that, I still think we were more effective going back to a base camp or to a truck camp. Uh, each night and then going back up into that area. And we found the elk, most of them were within uh, two to five miles of the road, which I think is very manageable, both from a, a hunting standpoint and a packing standpoint. Mm-hmm. So you yeah. need, it's, I mean, especially going out of state, you need not only then we're going to this unit and this A area looks good, but you need your B, C, and D plans because oh, if man. you go into A, you know, and it's not cooking, I mean, you have typically... How many spots do you have in mind, say, for an out-of-state hunt? <laughs> uh, I, I've learned that lesson the hard way. And, you know, I hunted Utah a few years back, and I didn't really have backup areas. Everyone I talked to said, this is the area, this is the area, this is the area. And there is no doubt that on previous years that had been the area. But the year I was there, it was a bad drought, and it wasn't. And we got stuck in a rut. I mean, we really hammered that area, and it just wasn't going to happen there. And that's a tag that took 10 years to draw. And I spent, I think, seven of my nine days pounding that area that wasn't going to produce it. Just, you know, by the time I, I really lifted my head up and said, what's going on here? We had lost a lot of time. And so I do, I, I have backup after backup after backup. And I will literally have maps printed off of Google Earth, places on my GPS. Um, I would say a minimum of six separate locations I'm not talking, you know, three drainages side by side by side that would basically fall under one area. In my mind, I've got six different locations to go and find out. So if I have to pick one a day, I'm going to get somewhere and find some elk. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, Corey, it's been, it's been awesome. Um, it's kind of covered a bunch of different topics and aspects, but we certainly <laughs> I appreciate feel like we've time. just scratched the surface. <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to say, we'll have to have you back uh, for sure. Maybe do some preseason talk and help get some guys ready for next year. So we'd love to have you on again. Definitely. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. It's always fun talking with both of you guys and especially when we get to talk about elk hunting. So yeah. appreciate okay. the opportunity. So what's the best way to uh, stay up with you is just kind of follow things through Elk 101 on social media and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. Elk 101 uh, is probably where I'm most active. 
uh, social media. I'm not a real great social media uh, participant, but yeah, if there's something noteworthy, it'll probably end up on Facebook and uh, Elk 101. We've got new articles every week aimed at helping people become more confident and more successful elk hunters. So Cool. Well, thanks so much, Corey. Awesome. Thanks, thanks guys. Corey. Appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap, guys. But before you go, can you do us a big favor and either leave us a review in iTunes and Stitcher, wherever you're listening to this, or just go ahead and send your feedback and questions to podcasts at xomountaingear.com. Once again, this podcast is brought to you by Exo Mountain Gear. We'd love for you to come check out the packs. Just visit xomountaingear.com. Be sure to let us know if you have any questions. Until next time, keep hunting. Thank you for listening to the Hunt Back Country Podcast.